Welcome everyone to the Dyer Memorial Library and Archives. Uh, on this Sunday, we're starting at a new starting time of two o'clock, giving it a try. Um, thumbs up, thumbs down. Anyone like the new starting time at two? Uh, anyone, anyone prefer 2.30? You're okay either way. Okay, okay. One, okay. You know, and I have no idea where the 2.30 came from. It's been there forever, and I'm thinking in the old days, okay, yeah, the family would have gone to church, come home, have a family dinner, and clearing up the table, and by 2.30, they're ready to go. Well, who does that anymore? You know, I mean, okay, someone does, I'm sure. <laughs> After I said it, I thought, yeah, someone does, and I'm insulting them. But anyway, old, <laughs> old people. <laughs> We're all old people. Uh, anyway, uh, and let's start the way we start all of our meetings with a salute to the flag. If you'd join me, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated, and thank you. We'll start off with a little bit of business first. This, of course, this program was scheduled for early December. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we had something happen days before we were going to do the program, and that was the passing of Marie Laylor. Marie was the relatively recent uh, head of the Dyer Memorial Library and Trustee, uh, I'm sorry, and Archives Trustees. Uh, she was a real go-getter. She was making a lot of changes here. Um, I, I saw her here overseeing work. Uh, the back room had been repainted and she was here every day, uh, babysitting, if you will, but getting it done and, and making changes and a really good attitude about the whole place. And she was on vacation with her, her husband, I think in St. Thomas, and passed away. Uh, kind of suddenly. I think she had had some bronchial issues, but it still was very sudden. So out of respect, we said we really can't just kind of carry on like nothing happened. So we decided to postpone. Uh, date unspecified. Uh, going along with that, we haven't been doing February programs for a long time after kind of a disastrous scheduling a few years back where we were planning a program and, you know, major snowstorm, and major snowstorm for like, you know, three weeks in a row. Every time we tried to reschedule, we couldn't. I finally said, that's it for February. We're not doing February anymore. But um, we're kind of, as you're all aware, playing a little loose with the schedule this year. And I thought, you know, let me kind of put it out there. That we're going to see about doing a February program and see if we can dodge the, the, the snowstorms and the nasty weather. So about a week and a half ago or something, I reached out to Betty and said, I, I think we're good. And printed up some postcards and sent out some emails. And here we are. Um, I'm well aware we're on cable and people might be seeing this program at any time. So uh, we, of course, just lived through a historic Arctic cold temperature period. Um, and you're all here. I, I hope you all survive without broken pipes and without any other catastrophes that can happen with those low temperatures. But we're also in a huge recoil from that. Um, I, I had a, the window open in my car on the way over here today thinking uh, this is amazing that the temperature has come up that much, but it has, and I understand we're going to be in the 50s by the middle of the week. So uh, anyone watching, we all survived this, <laughs> and we're back. Um, in addition to losing Marie, we also lost, let me think, oh God, her name just flew out of my head, one of our, uh, Lorraine Lovintuck, uh, a longtime member, and I had the uh, pleasure of working with her uh, when we were designing at Abington Senior Center. The one we designed never got built. They ended up buying a pre-built building anyway. Mm -hmm. But uh, Lorraine was a, a joy to, uh, to work with, and uh, she certainly missed. She lived to a ripe old age, 
but another another member gone, and we're sorry to hear that. Uh, some overnight news. Um, there was a two alarm fire, and thanks to John Croto for pointing this one out to me, at 306 Washington Street here in Abington. Um, it was a two alarm fire, and um, I'm told, I, I haven't heard officially, but actually Jane sitting back there, Jane Clockendale tells me that uh, it appears to be a total loss. And it's on our inventory of historic buildings in Abington. Um, and um, this, there's a great resource online called the, the Macris Register, the state, M-A-C-R-I-S. And it has pretty much all of the different towns' historic inventory forms on it. So I was just, without coming up here and opening a book, I was able to go online and find out that it is the King French Cottage uh, built in 1849. Uh, king was a rather important character in town. Uh, he built the King House at the corner of Summer Street in Washington, which became a shoe factory, though he intended it to be a hotel. Uh, he thought the railroad was going to come this side of Island Grove Pond and he would get all the business. Also, Bedford Street was the new Bedford Turnpike and he was expecting to get all this hotel business. Well, the railroad went to the other side and he didn't get any business and he turned it into a shoe factory. He was also important in the Congregational Church. Um, the, they were worshiping in the building at the Fork in the Road on Route 18 and Washington Street, right at the head of the hill, across from the current United Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. And um, they sent the minister out of the country and without telling him, built a new church across the street. And he said, you know, we pay for this by selling pews, but I will guarantee the financing. So he was trying to create his own little empire at the head of the hill and kind of did. So that's why we have that fourth building of the Congregational Church, the first Congregational Church, the fourth building, now the United Church of Christ, because of King. And this was a cottage that he apparently lived in while the big house was being built. So it's, it was a very important building that we just lost. So that was something sad, uh, and naturally sad for the owners who lost it. I, I didn't hear that there was any injury or loss of life, and I would have thought that would have been the lead story if it was the case. So, um, but nonetheless, we, we just lost an important historic building in town, um, and someone else lost their home. So have to keep our eye on the prize on that one. I also wanted to update you folks. Um, our last program we did here was actually the beginning of November. And Jane came in to talk about, she's sitting in the back hiding over there, but she came in to talk about rescuing the 1948 Seagrave that was engine one here in Abington until the town retired it. And it's been through a lot and it's been to a lot of places. And we talked about the notion of um, using community preservation funds to uh, restore it. We did get approved for the initial application, but uh, they expressed any doubts about actually giving us any money at this time, us, them, any money at this time, uh, because they asked the difficult questions. And things have happened because they asked the difficult questions. Where are you going to keep it? And who's going to take care of it? Those are really good questions when you think about it. So uh, Jane and I've been I've been coaching from the background and, and consulting, but Jane is forming a committee that is going to deal with all of that, and they they are looking at the possibility of building a garage for it, a place to put it. So um, there is a logo for them. Um, you might recognize the dog, you might not, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and uh, and they, they have stationery for their steering committee, and they are due to be considered, I understand, they have a letter into the Board of Selectmen in the town of Abington to be officially recognized because the town owns the engine. So you can't just walk in and say, we're going to rebuild it, we're going to house. It's the town's. So the town has to authorize the formation of what we hope would be an ad hoc committee to, to do this, to work with something that the town owns and, and look after it and restore it and maintain it and everything that goes along with owning an antique vehicle. So that's the progress that has happened. Uh, Jane, you've been having some meetings at the Legion Building of Interested Parties. When's the next meeting? This Thursday. This, this Thursday of this week? Yes. Okay. Five o'clock. Okay, at the Legion Building. Yes. 
So anyone who's interested, there are people who are interested, so that's encouraging and we're hoping that will move forward. Um, I've been chatting about a bunch of possible locations for where it might end up, uh, where a garage, whatever, museum might end up to go along with it. So that's ongoing and we'll keep you up to date since a lot of you are here for the program that, in which it was featured. I think that catches, no it doesn't quite catch us up. Um, we have other meetings planned. The next one, uh, the first Sunday in March, will be our first in a while show and tell meeting about a collection of something. The collection happens to be the Dyer collection. Um, the Dyer family uh, provided the funds and the trust to create this facility and a lot of their legacy exists in this building. I mean, we look at a lot of it around us between portraits and artwork and clocks and whatever. A lot of this stuff came from the Dyer family. So um, it was actually, they stepped up first and said, we'd like to do a show and tell about what we've got. And they're gonna mount an entire exhibit to go along with it. The show and tell will just be, we'll, we'll scratch the surface, honestly, uh, and we'll encourage everyone to come up and see the actual exhibit that delves much further into what's here from the Dyer family. So that will be the March program, the April program, uh, was inspired by, strangely, the closing of the Congregational Church in Rockland. Um, it's part of a phenomena, and I thought it was a recent phenomena, and then I started checking in into it further and realized it wasn't. Churches come, churches go. And, and I kind of want to at least start with an overview from the three towns about the various churches we've had over the years when they were formed, which ones closed, which ones merged, uh, and what happened to them. And, and certainly we'll maybe delve into some that we either have a lot of information about or that seem to particularly pique our curiosity or leave us scratching our heads as to why that happened. But uh, anyway, but it was inspired by that closing. And uh, I haven't even titled the series yet, but it will be something we hope clever and something, something interesting because it's an ongoing phenomenon. Uh, I had assumed that the super churches were the only things that were growing, but I actually had a minister said, no, no, they're losing people too. Uh, it's just their numbers are so big, you don't notice it as much. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, an on, it's an ongoing phenomenon, but it's not a new phenomenon. So we'll discuss that then. We're going to be, I'm going to be asking the membership, how many here are members? Just show of hands. Good, this is a good turnout, thank you. Um, I'm going to be asking the membership to consider over the next couple months, maybe we'll do it at that meeting, to adopt some changes to our structure and how we do things. Uh, right now we have a $12 annual membership, that's fine. Um, I'd like to change it to a $20 suggested donation. If you can only give us five bucks, that's fine. If you can give us 50, that's fine too, but we're just going to suggest an annual membership of 20. And uh, we, I, I would hope to up the lifetime membership. I think it's 75 now, maybe take it to 100. These things haven't been adjusted in decades, and, and I just kind of want to catch up with the times a little bit when it comes down to that. So that's part of it. Also, what do you get for your membership? Uh, those of you who have access to Facebook, one of the things that under consideration is a private Facebook page. I run one of these for a class reunion group. Um, no ads, no nothing, it's just for members. And you can come on and exchange ideas, you can share with us what's happening in your town that we might not know about, that we might be interested to know about. Uh, but it's a way to keep it out of the general realm of advertising and whatever crap of Facebook and make it just for us. Uh, as I said, I have a class reunion group on there that, that loves it. I mean, because we, we share whatever's going on in our lives and we all, we're all interested in it. And it would be the same idea here. We'd talk about local history in the three towns and, and share what's going on. You know, if, if it weren't for a member reaching out, I would not know, have known about the fire on Washington Street today. I wouldn't have. I would have found out about it, but it would have further down the road. So I think that's something we can offer in terms of a membership is access to unique, in, uh, unique information. Um, there's been a few changes at the Dyer as well I wanted to catch, catch you up on. There is now an internal camera system here. Um, I just was made aware of it this week myself. 
Uh, apparently, there was some mistaken information about a potential theft, which didn't happen. Something was misplaced. It wasn't stolen. But it was enough, I guess, to make the trustees sit back and say, you know, we're kind of vulnerable. So they, they made that choice to do that. But um, we'll, we'll see what happens in the long run. Uh, with Marie's passing, I believe the trustees are meeting the middle of this month to do some reorganizing. And we'll see which direction they take things from that. It should prove interesting. We've had a really congenial um, relationship with them, and we, we want that to continue, naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a good part of the outreach program for them by doing what we do. Anyway, enough of me rambling on. <laughs> I'm going to invite Betty Brown up. Elizabeth Brown, pardon me. Please join me. <laughs> uh, almost a year ago, uh, we had the Deborah Sampson chapter of the DAR in. Um, I think there's a couple of members here today. I see Kathy. And, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming back. And um, they talked about what the DAR did and a lot of their achievements, a lot of what their organization was all about. Uh, but... Um, Actually, Betty came to me afterwards, and you were more interested, or you were interested in exploring more about the person yes. that, that led to all of this. And let me introduce you with some background. Uh, you're from Abington. Mm -hmm. You live in the old family home. <laughs> I went to school, high school with your brother. <laughs> so, and now uh, you've done extensive work at the Adams Birthplace, birthplace and Mansion, or just well, the mansion? It's the Adams National Historical Park. So the Na Adams National Historical Park. Yeah, okay. So the two Why presidents. <laughs> no, so okay. you mean, do, I, <laughs> do I need to speak into that? <laughs> no, just make sure they can hear you in the background. Okay. <laughs> so um, basically, I've been at the Adams for over 20 years. So mm -hmm. my area of expertise is really the Adams. <laughs> the not, Adams family. Deborah, but uh, <laughs> I was interested and um, after the DAR came, I thought, uh, why not dip my toe in there? And and Doug said, I- he, I said, go for it. He, yeah, he said, go for it. So <laughs> a, a, I do deep have some notes and these are not, it, it's just thick paper. <laughs> so. And, and actually she provided us with copies of her brochure that are on the entry yes. table. And yes. There's... yes, because Deborah will um, die, when, live a lot of her life in Sharon. So the Sharon Library um, has some brochures and it has a tour through mm -hmm. Sharon and you can go to various places that Deborah Sampson lived at and and it right, takes you right to the historic sites to the to the grave as well <laughs> so um, start to finish yes yeah, start to finish <laughs> Anyway, um, you actually, she actually created the artwork for the card, by the way, but... Yeah. And it's, I put the painting over there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not that one, but I took it from there. Uh, from Joe Stones. Yes. Anyway. And he did this when Deborah um, will write a book about her life, so... This was part of the process of writing the book? That yes. She... Herman Mann uh, came to her and asked if he could write about her life story when he found... They called her and Sharon the old soldier. The old... So, appropriate. And so she, uh, he has a painting made of her. Okay. So this is pretty much what she looked like. <laughs> okay. Now the long and short story is this is a woman who during the revolution um, masqueraded as a man and served in the army and, and as, as a soldier and with distinction, by the way. But let's kind of delve into that. I, I think we start with, well, where she was born. Yes. So she's born at Plumpton. And she's born, this is her grandparents' house. And it's still standing today. You can actually go to this house. The woman there, um, uh, Mrs. Brown. Mrs. Brown, Mrs. Uh, Brown. Uh, any relation here, Betty? No, I did ask. <laughs> Brown with an E, she told me. So. Okay. But she You does. guys dropped the E. Yeah, I, yeah, we dropped the E. So she, um, she says she gets usually one student a year that comes to, that's doing a report on Deborah Sampson. And knocks on her door. Knocks on her door. And she lets them in. She was very, very nice. Uh, the house still has 39 acres of land. Wow. So um, when you pull up to this house, there is a big wooden sign that says the birthplace of Deborah Sampson. Nice. So Deborah is actually born in 1760, and she's uh, probably the fifth child. Well, the there's the list. Child. There you go. <laughs> so she, um, her mother is Deborah Bradford Sampson. So she is of the Mayflower Bradfords. Um, 
But when Deborah is just five years old, her father, Jonathan, uh, abandoned the family. So he took off, and the family kind of had a story that he went down on a ship. So they were embarrassed that the father had abandoned them. But he didn't go he down on a ship. Down, <laughs> okay. uh, they'll find him later in Maine, which is still Massachusetts. Back then, yeah. Maine was, was part of Massachusetts. Yes, doesn't you know, become Maine until, until 1820. Okay. So he's living in Friendship, Maine, with a woman named Martha, which starts a whole other family. He couldn't take care of this family, and he starts another family. Well, you know, yeah. fresh start. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so he's a tall man, though. He's he's about six feet tall, and Deborah will be very tall. She's about five eight, which is taller than most men at that time. For them, yeah. Yeah, she's yeah. very tall. Most women are five feet or under five feet. So, when Deborah's father takes off, her mother cannot take care of the family. So the mother um, keeps the two youngest. Nehemiah and Sylvia, but the rest of the children, except Robert, Robert died, um, were actually given away. And she was given away to a woman um, named Ruth Fuller. That and was she fun. was probably with Ruth for, oh. oh, that's the house in Plumpton. <laughs> I'm jumping. That's okay. <laughs> okay. So she's, she's with Ruth probably for three years. Mm -hmm. And we believe Ruth taught her to read and write and she would probably read the Bible to her every day. She really loved learning. Uh, unfortunately, Ruth died, and then she is given away again to a Margaret Thatcher. This is probably all in Plimp Plimpton, but um, those two houses, I'm, I don't think they're standing anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, two years later, this woman passed away. She was the widow to the minister. Now, when that happens, Deborah is now 10 years old, and they give her to a minister in Middleborough, uh, Benjamin Thomas and his wife Susanna, and they have five boys. And she's an indentured servant at this time. So women, when they were indentured, would be indentured to the age of 18. That's considered marriageable age. So they assumed you would get married. Women didn't have a lot of choices. You either married or you became a spinster. <laughs> Those were your two choices. <laughs> A lot of choices. <laughs> so Deborah uh, is actually doing everything in Middleborough at that farm. Um, she's helping raise those boys. Uh, they will have five more boys, so there'll be ten all together. Oh, my together. God. She's got her no, hands no, no girls? She was it? No girls. That's an interesting yeah. gene line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Deborah is helping with the farm. She's plowing fields. She's planting crops. Uh, she's riding the horse into town. Um, she's pretty much hands-on. She does everything. Um, but when the boys were going to school, she actually begged the family to send her to, and they wouldn't do it. So she gets, a, she gets around this by every time the children, the boys came home with their homework, homework. And their books, she read them all. Uh, she becomes smarter than probably <laughs> any of the boys. But she's... Um, also, at this time, I mean, if you think about it, she's born in 1760. Ten years later, when she's uh, first with this family, the Boston Massacre happens. Shortly after that, you have uh, the Boston Tea Party, and then you have Lexington and Concord, and then you have the Battle of Bunker Hill. Deborah is a young girl watching all of this, and most of the men are going off to war. She's a very tall girl. She's going to learn how to weave because... We have that boycott with England. They're trying not to bring in any cloth. You can't buy clothes. So now it has to be made here in America. And she's really very good at weaving. Actually, people are seeking her out. But in Middleborough, there was a tavern called Sprout Tavern. And Sprout Tavern, uh, many weavers would. Do we have that in here? It's not uh, familiar. We do have it in there. We have, well, we have. It's still a house. That's right? still that's still plugged in. Okay. So that's the house that she lives in, the Thomas house. It's still standing. Okay. No longer a farm. This is Sprout. This Sprout. Okay. So the only thing left here is the outhouse. It was a three seater. <laughs> so they saved it. The outhouse. There it is. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> so at least there's something left. There's, at least there's something left. So at Sprout Tavern, there was a notch cut out at the door, right marked at five feet, five inches. And men would come to Sprout Tavern to enlist. Uh, and 
they would go stand and see if they were tall enough to enlist. Uh, there wasn't a lot uh, <laughs> to reject. People just had to be five Had to be people. tall enough just and you're, tall you're enough in. And then you're in, yeah. They didn't ask you um, where you were born. They didn't ask you. Whether you had loyalty to the king or not. They asked you nothing. <laughs> okay. They pretty much took anybody. So she is weaving and she decides to go check out to see if she's tall enough. And she does and she seems to be taller than most anybody. So she tucks that little bit of information aside. Um, she meets some of the minimum qualifications. She does. She does. <laughs> Missing one key one, but... <laughs> yes, yes. Um, just to give you an idea what she looked like, because uh, people do wonder how did she pass as a man. Mm. Um, she's, as I say, very tall, 5'8". Mm. She was described as not beautiful. <laughs> So just regular. Um, she had a long nose, a long jaw. Um, she wasn't fat, she wasn't thin. And they said she did not have much of a chest. So that probably helped her when she decided. They were all making excuses for why they couldn't figure it out. Yeah. Right? Let's face it. Yeah, yeah. OK. So she is uh, now, when nobody can make uh, go to England and get cloth, mm -hmm. and she was sought after. Um, she would often stay at people's homes and make cloth for the whole year for the whole family. Um, and sometimes specialty cloth was called bespoke, and they, people would ask for that as well. But she would go from household to household if they requested her. Uh, she, she would do this for six months out of the year after she turned 18. And this is a way of her making money. And she also uh, is very well educated, and only men taught school, really. Um, all the children usually were sent to men teachers. They were going off to war. Mm -hmm. Middleborough asked her to uh, become a teacher for six months out of the year. So she would be making money teaching, and she would also be making the other half of the year making cloth. And she's with one of the families in Middleborough, the Leonard family, and their son had gone off to uh, join the army. And she decides to try on his clothing <laughs> to see how it fit, how she looked. She tries she, it on. She was plotting. She was plotting. <laughs> <laughs> she gets dressed. Uh, she decides to go out at night to the Sprout Tavern and uh, enlist. So she does. Nobody's asked. Nobody realizes it's Deborah. She enlists as uh, Timothy Thayer. Timothy? <laughs> Timothy Thayer. 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 Okay. Yes. T-H-A-Y-E-R. Got it. So... Uh, she's successfully done this, so she's decided to celebrate. They've given her $50 uh, bounty to sign on, and she decides to stay at the tavern and treat all the men in the tavern to rum. So she's buying rum and she's drinking rum, and she realizes at the end of the evening she probably shouldn't be drinking the rum. She doesn't remember what she said to anybody, <laughs> and she may have, you know, let loose that she... Let the cat out of the bag, so to speak? Yes, yeah. yes. So she goes back to the Leonard's house, sneaks in, and she gets back into women's clothing. And for the next week, she is not dressed as a man. But on the town green, all the men that have signed up are now mustering on the green, and there is no Timothy there. So they're all wondering what happened to Timothy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> An older woman that uh, was also weaving at Sprout Tavern said, I noticed that Deborah Sampson had a cut on her hand. And that Timothy there fellow, he had the same cut on his hand when he signed up. I think it's the same person. Well, nobody really chased after her, but she decides to lay low. But at nighttime, uh, she would go out and go for a stroll, and usually go to a new town. Like she would, she walked to, to Taunton, for instance. Not very close. I was going to say that's a hike. <laughs> yeah. She didn't walk. You wouldn't go out walking as a woman. They could arrest you. They would think that you were uh, indentured and dodging. Or loose. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but they thought, they thought you might be a, a wife running away from your husband. Mm -hmm. um, you just couldn't walk around mm -hmm. if you were a woman. So dressing as a man, she could walk to the next town and nobody stopped her. But when she got to Taunton, she saw um, a neighbor. <laughs> I believe his name was William Bennett. 
she saw him i think he saw her but he didn't recognize her but she was so worried about it she jumped into some bushes and hid and then she hightailed it back to middleborough uh she waited around the next week to see if anybody uh, said anything now a woman dressing in men's clothing and being caught could be arrested thrown into prison and also fined so you didn't usually do that but she's getting away with it because she looks probably very manly. <laughs> she, just she, she was convincing. She was convincing. And, and she was rehearsing when you think about it. I think she was rehearsing. Yeah. So she decides to walk to New Bedford. The next trip, she goes to New Bedford. And um, while she's in New Bedford, she's in a tavern. I don't think she's drinking. <laughs> and some people realize she's looks pretty strong. And why don't they try to sign her up for one of the ships and they talk to her and she's thinking about it because her her uncle simon had been on a ship and i should note at this point in time her uncle simon was in the french and indian war he was captured and he managed to escape by dressing as a woman <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> might, go in the, might be in the family running the family something <laughs> so after the, uh, I believe, whoever was trying to sign her up leaves the tavern, one of the sailors came up to her and told her, don't do it. The captain is a harsh master, you know, so she realizes, you know. Careful she, what you're signing up for. Yeah, she yeah. dodged that bullet. So right. she, she takes off, she goes back to Middleborough, but she's doing this constantly. And I'm starting to think she was trying to find the highest bounty because different towns uh -huh. gave you a different amount of money. She would go to Boston. Uh, they say as she walked back from Boston. Now wow. that's like 54 miles yeah. from Middleborough. Yeah. So she probably took her time, but walking back, she walks actually to Uxbridge. And when she gets to Uxbridge, uh, and I should note, all the clothes she's wearing now are clothes she made. Uh, and she was very good at it, so nobody was missing their clothing. <laughs> <laughs> she gets to Uxbridge, and they offer her 60 pounds to join up. And she joins up in Uxbridge. Uh, now, she stays in Uxbridge. Now, this is also far away from home. It's pretty far away. So no one's going to suspect she's at Deborah Sampson because no yes. one's ever heard of Deborah Sampson in Uxbridge. Exactly. And part of her fear in, in Middleborough, as Timothy said, She'd get, get found. She thought for sure somebody would recognize yeah. her and, you know, she'd end up in prison. So in Uxbridge, uh, she signs up. Um, a muster master comes from West Point, gathers up 40 or 50 of the men, and takes them to the Hudson River, they cross the Hudson River, and this is where she starts her life as Robert Shirtliff, her, her uh, oldest brother's name. She would always thought that Robert was her mother's favorite child, uh, and she <laughs> felt using his name probably would be a good thing. So she just says she is Robert Shirtliff. She will go to the encampment in New Windsor, which is still there. Now, in New Windsor, there are all of these caverns you had to build your own log cabin. Now, each of these log cabins just had two rooms. Each room held six to eight men, and they had three to four beds in each room, and you slept two men to a bed. Mm -hmm. She was a little worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> but having to build her own log cabin, uh, that really wore them out. They, they were worn out from walking there. They were busy every day. Uh, I believe the second day there, they were given the manual of arms from Baron von Steuben. Washington told them they had to build a, or put in gardens next to the log cabins. Uh, he didn't want a repeat of Valley Forge, so he knew all the men, as long as they could make a garden, mm -hmm. would have enough food. And she, as we know from Middleborough, she, she was really how. a very good farmer, mm -hmm. so she knew what she was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, men were given their uniforms, they were given their uh, musket they were given uh, pretty much everything they needed when they first arrived uh, and they would also be given rum and she never uh, drank the rum she always traded it either for writing materials or for linen mm -hmm. so she settles right into life um, you didn't have to bathe it wasn't mandatory so she didn't have to worry about bathing with other men but if the men weren't bathing and got a little pugnant uh, they did 
requests that you bathe. <laughs> she always bathed after all the other men were asleep. She would um, bathe all by herself, uh, kind of hidden away. So she, she stayed clean. And this is a picture of one of those. The cabins, the huts. Yes. Huts in New Windsor. Yes. So. They recreated some. Cool. Yes. And this is what a uniform would have looked like. Uh, the two muskets you see here, one is French and one is British. Now she is in the 4th Massachusetts Regiment. And because she's so tall, she's actually the tallest in her unit. She stood out. But because she didn't drink rum and she didn't play cards, as the other men were entertaining themselves, she was practicing uh, the manual of arms. And she was really very, very good. Um, they were given the lighter French rifle. And she is part of the light infantry. And it was considered uh, the the best unit, the most elite unit in the American Army. Um, and she is one of the people in the Army that really stood out, um, not just because of her height. It's because she didn't drink, she didn't play cards. Uh, she always uh, volunteered for missions when they spoke of them. Now, she joins in 1782. And as you probably all know, the war ended 1781 at Yorktown, but it really didn't end. Actually, Washington requested 10,000 more troops after Yorktown because he didn't trust the British. He felt uh, they would be duplicit. And so there are still 25,000 British regulars on American soil, and most of them are in New York. New Windsor is in New York, and there was a neutral zone between the Loyalists and the British and the Americans. The Loyalists and the Tories were always crossing over and attacking the Americans. <laughs> so the, Washington was actually right. We, they lost more men in 1782 than they did in the first, the first year of the war. Wow. Scary. Yeah. So this is uh, von, Steuben. von Steuben, who uh, I do have his manual of arms over here in case anybody wants to practice it. So, in case anyone wants to know what they knew. In case anybody wants to know. So, uh, she's really a very good soldier. Uh, I believe on the 10th day that she was there, they sent her out uh, with 40 men. Uh, the men split into two groups. Uh, they were near Tarrytown, and Washington wanted them to bring back um, information. Uh, the two groups separated, and they were going to meet up at White Plains, but they, they were sleeping at Tarrytown, which is close to New Windsor. And while she was uh, with her group, uh, she said a volley of musket balls went over their heads, and she said one went through her head, her, her hat, and her sleeve. Um, close by in Tarrytown, they heard the guns going off, and they rushed to help out the mm -hmm. unit. She said uh, the Loyalists were coming at them. Uh, they were way overnumbered, and they had um, horses. She, they weren't on horses, mm -hmm. her group. Um, she said they lost three men that night. So that was her introduction. And she stayed. She wasn't afraid. She, she did her, her job. She stuck with it. She stuck with it. And a few days later, she uh, went out again. And uh, the next skirmish she was in, she was shot. She was shot in two places. Oh, wow. Now, um, some people say she was shot in the shoulder. And some people say she was shot in the leg. Um, and she also uh, received a saber wound to her head. But she couldn't let anybody treat. She did have one in her leg. She couldn't let anyone treat it. It was pretty high up on her thigh. And she realized she had to get the ball out herself or she would be exposed. Mm -hmm. So um, someone in her unit actually uh, remember Sprout Tavern. The owner, his name was Ebenezer Sprout, was 6'5". And oh. it was, uh, he actually was a giant. <laughs> he was a giant. Uh, he had come uh, to help, and he didn't recognize it. He would have known Deborah Sampson. He, she was covered in um, soot and sweat. He never, he never recognized her, so she realized, you know, probably no one she knew would recognize her. But uh, they did bring her to a French hospital, which was pretty close by, and she managed to dig out the ball in her leg before the doctor got to her. Mm. So he never had to really examine her too well. So she got away with... Um, once again. Once they... again, yeah, being <laughs> a man. So, but after that, uh, she wouldn't have gone out on skirmishes for a bit of a while. 
when they decided it was um, not too harsh of a, 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 a skirmish. They, they sent her mm -hmm. with a, a group just to uh, bring back information. And they, again, they had been attacked by loyalists. And a friend of their, uh, well, one of the men soldiers, Richard Snow, had been injured very badly. Mm -hmm. Now she's still hurting from her injuries, and the rest of the unit got back to to the encampment. And she said, "I'll just go to Van Tassel's house, who was close by and supposed to be a patriot, but actually he was a, a loyalist." So she goes to his house and asks for help. He put the two of them in the attic, and it must have been summertime because it was pretty hot in the attic. Then he never brought them any food, he never brought them any water. And she could hear what was happening in the rest of his house. And she hears loyalists coming and plotting, and he's figuring they're probably both going to die up in his mm -hmm. attic. He wasn't worried about it. Uh, Richard Snow did pass away, and um, Deborah decides she best get out of there. And she went out a window and got back to her unit and reported him. And they did actually raid his house, arrest a lot of the loyalists, as well as Van Tassel. This almost happens again to her. She is on another run with some other soldiers. And they're being overpowered by loyalists. And they take refuge in a widow Hunt's house. Widow Hunt is also supposed to be a patriot, but she also was a loyalist. and so. She would tell them she's going to send her servant. And we're not sure if the servant was a slave <laughs> or a servant. She was going to send the servant for uh, refreshments. But actually, he would be going uh, to get the loyalists to come to her house. Turning and capture them. Yeah. 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 Uh, so they, she was effectively a spy. Well, she realized, yes, yeah, she was a spy. She was. Yeah. <laughs> and Deborah didn't trust her and said, I think we better get out of here. And they got out of there. And as they did, they realized. Uh, they saw that the loyalists were coming, and they realized that she had uh, set them up. Right. Yeah. So. So what are we looking at in the map here? So I believe this is uh, the area of the winter encampment. Okay. Kind of hard to see, isn't it? Well, we'll move on. The writing's very <laughs> tiny. Now this is um, her her general. Patterson. Patterson. Okay. So. Now she will be. Uh, Patterson's aide. Uh, some generals would have four aides, and he would pick her to be an aide for him at West Point. And she would basically lay out his clothes, bring him his food, that kind of a thing. Girly stuff? Uh. <laughs> yeah, it's only men. <laughs> so she, she really liked Patterson, too. Okay. And that was General Knox. Okay. But I'll, I'll tell you, while she is... Um, Still at um, the encampment, uh, a lot of soldiers were being released. It's, it's 1783, where we're winding down the war, and they hadn't been paid. They hadn't been paid while they were there. They hadn't been paid when they were released. And a lot of men went to Philadelphia. They marched on Congress and decided they would get their money one way or another. Some of the congressmen got out of the building and got word to Washington that they were under siege. Uh. And Washington sent 1,500 men to Philadelphia to help. To protect. To protect yeah. them. And she was one of the men he sent. She was going on horse. The horse got lame. She had to wait four days. By the time she got to Philadelphia, it, it, was, was, all over. Over. it was all over. With <laughs> but she got to hang around. And Transportation she, such a bear. I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> So she is now a tourist while she's in Philadelphia. Okay. But Philadelphia uh, was hit with an epidemic. And now people were just dying by the hundreds. And Deborah caught whatever it was. And they brought her to a hospital. Um, she remembers um, just barely seeing them take out a dead body and put her on the bunk he was just at. And then she realizes the two orderlies there are fighting over her pants. Uh, who's going to get them when she's about to die? And they figure they're going to carry her out of there any moment and throw her on a big pile of dead Bodies. people. Yeah. Yes. So she's trying to talk. She can't. And I think she manages to grab one of their shirts and she's pulling on it. And they realize she's not dead. So they call the doctor, Dr. Binning. 
And Dr. Benny realizes he he's the first one that decides Figured to... Figure it out. He, he's feeling her chest to see if she's got any breath. And he realizes she's not built like a, <laughs> a soldier that he's known. So he actually tells the matron to put her in the matron's room. And she's slowly getting better. And when she gets a bit better and stronger, Dr. Benny sent her to his house to be with his wife and his niece. He never told his wife and his niece that she was um, a woman. So, but he knew. But he knew. <laughs> okay. So he does ask her, her, or Robert, to take his niece and his wife around and keep them safe, and he did. And before Robert Shirtliff goes back to his unit, Dr. Benny is approached by Colonel Tupper, a friend of his from Sharon, actually. And Tupper asked, could he give him five men so he could, uh, he was going to go westward and he's exploring, looking for minerals in the mountains. And Benny approaches Deborah and asks, would she like to go with them? And she really does want to have some adventure, so she says yes. So she's dressed as a soldier. Uh, she goes, uh, first they take a coach and then they take a ship. And one of their first stop was actually George Washington's house at Mount Vernon. Of course, he's not there. <laughs> but they got to go through and tour George Washington's house. They left George Washington's house, they're on a ship and they're traveling down a river and they, they have to stop, they get off the boat. And now it's so foggy, they can't see in front of them and they, they stop for the night and then it starts to thunder and lightning. Uh, Tupper has five or six dogs with him, and one of the dogs that's next to Deborah gets hit by lightning, oh. and, it, and it's killed instantly. Now, the next morning, uh, a bunch of Indians approach them, and they don't seem that friendly. <laughs> and the chief uh, is kind of pointing. He wants to take one of Tupper's men with him. And they're a little worried. They're thinking they're going to be scalped for sure. And Deborah actually volunteers. She figures, my mind. Uh, how, how bad can it be? <laughs> <laughs> she felt they were better than Mohawks. She said yeah. the Mohawks were killing all the white men whenever they came across them. So she goes with them. And they actually bring her to a cave. And one of the dogs follows her. And she says, I was so nervous. I'm, I'm patting the dog constantly because it's, it's calming me. And they show her there are three dead Indians in oh. the cave. And they had been hit by lightning. Uh -huh. And she said, oh, the same thing had happened to their dog. So one of the, one of the Indian starts like whooping, <laughs> whooping, we, like, and it's so scary that all the soldiers she had been with, which aren't very close, um, but they they could hear it and they figured, oh, they just scalped they Robert. They killed her. They just scalped <laughs> Robert. But they join up and they asked, uh, would they help bury and honor the three dead uh, soldiers, uh, okay. th three dead Indians, and they did. Uh, so now she's survived a bayonet attack, uh, multiple gunshots, yep, uh, a plague, yep, and, and this is this Indian, yeah, yes, okay, and she's not done with these Indians. Um, she's actually going to, um, she, they they're with the thirty more Indians, and she gets very sick. It's like the the epidemic has revisited her. She's okay. so sick. Relapse. Uh, yeah, yeah, relapse. And Tupper says. Can you watch her till we come back? You know, we'll be back at the next moon or something. <laughs> so the Indian says yes, but the chief doesn't look all that thrilled. Well, she gets better. They give her Indian medicine, and she she's like better the next day. But she decides she better have some goodwill, and she decides if they go out on a hunting party, she'll go with them. She'll bring back food, and he hooks her up with. An old man and a boy. So that's her hunting party. Okay, her team. And, yes, her team. They actually uh, get, they shoot three turkeys and a bison and a buffalo. It says. Oh wow. So I don't know exactly where they are, but there's a buffalo. So, but while she's with this old man and the boy, uh, something about the old Indian. Uh, got her on high alert again and she she keeps looking at her kind of funny and she decides oh, he doesn't like me and when they go to sleep at night she decides not to close her eyes she's gonna just pretend to be asleep and he that old Indian comes up to her with a tomahawk and tries to kill her in the middle of the night but oh. she is sleeping with her gun 
and she shot him, which scared the little boy because he thinks now he's going to die. And she, she lets him know, see, he's holding the tomahawk. So, uh -huh. so everything's okay. But these two now are lost in the woods. And she just survived a tomahawk attack. And she just survived a tomahawk attack. This is, this is like worse than a soap opera here. I'm telling you. <laughs> well, the next group of Indians she's with, there is a white woman with them, and she's obviously a captive. And Deborah tells them that she'll, she tells this woman that she will try to help her. Now, when she gets back with the, the first tribe that the little boy is from, He's, the chief is so happy that the little child is returned to him, she decides to ask a favor and she asks, could she have a bride? And he says, you can, but you can't have an Indian. So she's, she wants the white woman. Uh -huh. And he says, well, we'll have to haggle for it. And he tells her, Robert can have this white woman, but it will cost her three guns. So when Tupper arrives, she tells Tupper, can you give the give them three guns. Give them three guns, and they do. So Robert manages to save this woman. Uh, Tupper, when they get back to Philadelphia, buys this young girl uh, a dress and buys her a ticket and sends her back to, um, she's from New Jersey, I believe. Sends her home. home. Sends her home, yeah. Oh, no, she's from Virginia. Okay. So now... She has to go back to Dr. Binney. Dr. Binney said, when you come back, I want to see you. So she goes back to Dr. Binney, and Dr. Binney has written a letter for General Patterson. So Deborah says, hey, this man saved my life. I have to do it. So she takes the letter. She says, well, you know, she's been part of the Army for almost two years. And she decides, well, I'm going back to West Point. It's pretty much the end of the, the war almost. Anyways. Things are just about over. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, the Peace Treaty of Paris was signed, and uh, she gets on a ship, and then the weather turns bad. Now, they see a ship in front of them, and it goes down. Now, everyone on the ship had died, and now the waves are hitting the ship she's on, and it capsizes, and she swims to Staten Island, and she's lying on the shore just exhausted. Like everything is happening to this woman. I, I wouldn't want to be with her. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds so, like she's bad luck. I'm telling you. She's lying on the shore, and she's uh, not sure if anybody else has made it. There was only 12 other people on board the ship she was on, and all of them but two uh, did survive. So another ship comes along, takes them, and says they'll bring them to West Point you know, in a few days. And in a few days, she is delivered to West Point, and she is going to bring the letter to as as Pat's, commanded to, to Patterson. It survived a shipwreck and everything else. She better bring it. Yep. So she brings it to Patterson, and he I don't think he believes what the letter says, you know. But he, he realizes the doctor has written the letter, so uh, it could very well be. And he does say something to the effect of Robert Shirtliff, you know. Private Robert Shirtliff, you are one of the best soldiers in my command. Um, but this letter, it it says that there Yay. is probably <laughs> something other uh, under your uniform <laughs> than what I am. The we can see. Could you please try on one of my wife's dresses? And she she almost faints because she thinks she's going to be shot. And he catches her and lets her sit in the chair. Mm -hmm. And she says, yeah, she'll, she'll try on one of the dresses. And she goes off to the room that she used to occupy. She tries on the dress, comes down, and he can't believe his eyes. He just can't <laughs> believe it's the same person. So he decides to call in one of her commanders, uh, I think Colonel Jackson. And he comes, and he comes into the room. He doesn't recognize her. Uh -huh. So uh, Patterson introduces them. And then... Patterson says to Deborah, I'd like to walk through the compound with you. I want to see if anybody recognizes you. So they take a little stroll through New Windsor encampment and nobody recognizes her. And he says to her, she's, she, she, he says, I'm not going to have you shot. You know, no, you're one of the best men that I've ever- You, you earned your keep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, he's actually kind of surprised all that she had been through. So he tells her she can stay in the room and she can keep the dress. And she asks him, 
could she please just keep wearing her uniform because she feels she is one of the men and she doesn't really want to give that away. So she's um, actually uh, honorably discharged and Henry Knox is the one that signs her papers and let her, lets her go. Mm -hmm. uh, she decides to go home, but she doesn't know where home is. <laughs> so home, she decides to go to this house. It's Aunt Alice and Uncle Zebulon. Uh, this is the water house, and it's still here today. So she shows up at their door. She's in her uniform, and they don't know who she is. And she tells them, and they, they let her in, and Uncle Zebulon says, you just wear that uniform as long as you want. You can wear <laughs> men's clothes until you're comfortable. And she helps them out on the, on the farm. And one of their neighbors, Benjamin Gannett, mm -hmm. meets her. And Do we have their friend? That's still, that's still more that's of. still is okay. everyone's house, yeah. Okay. So oh, this is okay. her wedding dress. I'm rushing things. That's okay. <laughs> she will she will eventually uh, marry uh, Benjamin, and Benjamin told her she could wear men's clothing as long as she was comfortable. Okay. Um, and now, Benjamin Gannett probably was a week in the American Revolution. He spent a week. His brother probably the same, and his father even served. Uh, probably for about 10 days. That's not very long. It's not very long, but... She had a career compared to that. Yes. Uh, Benjamin's father is Benjamin Sr., and he bought the wedding dress for for Deborah. And it wouldn't have been a white dress. You didn't wear white dresses. Not back then. And one of the relatives still owns this dress. Oh, wow. It survived. Yeah, it survived. Okay. So this is her wedding dress. And you would have probably worn it to church probably on Sundays and Wednesdays. So, now, she and Benjamin live in Sharon on an, a farm, and it's 49 acres. It's very hilly. It's very rocky. Uh, and her worst nightmare is coming true. Nothing in the war was as bad as what, in her mind, being married and having, say, your children taken away from you because you're so poor. And her mother, she felt, let the family down. She, she always felt like the, the mother abandoned her. So she was here, afraid of reliving her a, mother's life. Exactly. Okay. So here she is on this unproductive farm, mm -hmm. and uh, Herman Meehan comes to the farm, and he's heard about the old soldier, and he wants to, to meet Deborah Sampson. And he comes to her, and he tries to tell her he really wants to write a book about her. She is not interested in this, but he tells her, I will give you half of the proceeds. Please work with me on this book. So money, she says, money, yes. money, money. Hey. Yeah, she needs some money. <laughs> so she agrees and she uh, helps him, tells her story. But people say um, he was from Dedham and he was a newspaper writer. They don't think he wrote a very accurate account. Uh, he does write the book. Uh, they would have pre sold 200 books before it even was published. They charged 92 cents a book. Um, and they made a little money at first, and about 1,500 books were sold over a number of years. But she decides her husband is not well. He's very ill, and the only money coming in is what she's bringing in. So she decides to go on a tour. Women have never spoken in public, and she decides, uh, I think it was 18, uh, 1801 to 1802, and this is, uh, I think, a map of her touring. Yes, Using reflection. Sharon as a home base, we see yeah. heading to Providence, to Boston, to Worcester and Holden and Brookfield and Spring, heading out west where she served ultimately, yeah. apparently. I'm seeing Albany, Schenectady, yeah. uh, Hudson, Catskills, all the way down to New York City and as far out as, is it Lyle in New York? Yeah. yeah. I don't even know where that is. Uh, I believe Patterson lived there and she okay. visited him. Oh, there we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. So she was retracing a lot of her steps. She was. When she, after the book. Okay, yes. With the book. With the book. And when she... Now, are all these stories you have told us about her in the book? I uh, mean, surviving uh, shipwreck and, 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 and getting... Oh, you know... Surviving bayonet and surviving I, gunshots and, I mean... I believe it's... Her, the book that Herman uh, Mann wrote was called The Woman's Review, I believe. And I don't have a copy of that book, okay. so I'm not sure if that... If she told those okay. stories. Yeah, I'm not okay. sure. She probably did. That would be a page turner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would be. But when she uh, appeared, she would first come out in women's clothing. 
and she would uh, address the audience and tell the audience about her life and then she would leave and she would just leave for, for a short while. Mm -hmm. She would get into her uniform and then some of the soldiers she actually served with, she had gotten a hold of them, would march out with her onto the stage and she would have her, her musket with her and she would go through the manual of arms. And if you've ever seen one of those uh, soldiers throwing those rifles around, well, she could do that. And the audience said it was if the musket was part of her arm, she did it so well. And they were just overwhelmed. At first, they didn't believe that she really was a soldier. But after she finished doing the manual of arms, they, they, they actually stood up and would applaud. And they said, there were many non-believers when she first took the stage, but there was not any non-believers when she finished uh, with her lecture. She sold it. She sold it. <laughs> well, uh, she became more famous, didn't she? Yes. Well, many men were getting pensions from being in the American Revolution, but Deborah wasn't. And she would write to Congress probably 13 different times, and still, she never heard back from them. And Paul Revere actually had a forge near their house. Mm -hmm. The house that she and um, her husband Benjamin lived in uh, is no longer standing. It actually was moved to Canton, I believe, and I'm not sure if it's still standing there. It was a very tiny little house, and they had four children. They had three children, and they adopted another. But Paul Revere sought her out because he had heard about her, and he decided he really wanted to meet her. And he was expecting to see a very rough you know, kind of a manly woman, and he was very surprised when he met Deborah. He said she was very, very feminine, very well spoken, and he was so impressed with her. But when he looked around, he realized they couldn't be poor. He just, he just couldn't believe their but fate. They were living in poverty, yeah. Yeah, mm. and he steps in and he asks, could he please write a letter yeah. for her? And Paul Revere wrote to Congress, he, and he, he actually got her her money. They listened to Paul Revere. They better. I know. <laughs> so uh, she will meet him at Cobb's Tavern, which is still standing, uh, and he, he gave her her, like, her pension money that she hadn't had in quite a while. Um, a few years later, uh, veterans that were injured in the war were getting disability pay. Now, I should mention it was $4 <laughs> they got a month. Uh, it went a lot the, further then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she, the, but the veterans with disabilities would get three dollars more, so they uh, would get seven dollars a month. And she so, was wounded. And she was wounded. And uh, Paul Revere would say, you know, you could see um, she was having a hard time functioning. You have to remember, there's a lead ball inside of her, and she was probably slowly dying of lead poisoning. Wouldn't surprise him. So uh, this is actually her son Earl's house. It's 300 East Street in Sharon. Uh, he has nine children with his wife, Mary. Uh, Benjamin and Deborah would move into this house. It was only four rooms upstairs and four rooms down. Yeah. But uh, this is where she would have passed away, in this house here. And this is in front of the Sharon Library. You'll see she's in a dress and she's holding a, her musket and she's wearing a... Uh, Best of both worlds. Both, yeah. <laughs> part, part dress, part uniform, yeah. part... Yep. Part weapon. And she's got the, um, <laughs> the powder horn in her hand. Oh, there we go. We'll try going ahead. <laughs> Absolutely. So. And let's see. So that's what it says on her. On the headstone. On the headstone. Okay. So she's recognized under both names. Yeah. And her service is called out and her husband's acknowledged. I believe she's the only one recognized by the, the DAR. 68 uh, years is a good life back then, right? Yeah, I think she was actually 66. I know it says 68. Okay, 68, but, yeah. But she dies in 1827 and she was born in uh, 17. I can't do the math 16. that quickly, but there actually is the headstone. Yes. Absolutely. Now, she did this, but she wasn't the only one who did this, was she? No, no. Some, someone else did it. Yes. I, I have a list of names. No. <laughs> uh, but now, was she the only one who was ever recognized and got a pension yeah, and, a lot and of became them, famous for it? But there were other women who impersonated men to serve. Yeah, um, 
they didn't start properly as long. Okay, they weren't um, as successful. Yeah, we have people, I mean, like you've heard of Molly Pitcher. Mm -hmm. It's probably a composite of many women that, you know. But she was Molly Pitcher as Molly Pitcher. She wasn't. So she, she was probably Margaret Corbin. Okay. I mean, sure. Margaret Corbin fought next to her husband. Um, and when he died, uh, she started, she, she knew how to, to load the cannon. Uh, and she picked up where he left off. She was actually hit with a cannon. Um, I can't remember if she lost a leg or mm. she was hit in the shoulder as well. She was very badly, uh, very, very badly injured. Um, but they said she was a mean, mean woman. <laughs> <laughs> People did not like hanging out with her. She was a little mean. Um, rough around the edges, huh? <laughs> yeah, a little rough around the edges. Um, there was a, a two women caught by Patterson mm -hmm. uh, within a few months of, of their enlistment. Um, I think one... But now they were potentially subject to the penalties. I mean, That's like, right. And yeah. one, one of them was uh, placed in jail. Okay. Um, one woman was in the Army for about three months. Mm -hmm. Actually, she had made it to... to she had actually um, raised... She was some rank. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> but one of the... Um, one, I think it was Patterson, asked her to hand him a... Uh, tinket of beer and after she handed it to him she curtsied <laughs> <laughs> kind of gave her yeah guys don't do that <laughs> no yeah. definitely not so i think she she was in prison for a but i mean there's this easy to tell why there's a dar chapter named after deborah yes. Simpson. I yes. mean, she really distinguished herself she was local she came back yes but she experienced a lot she survived a lot i mean goodness plagues and yeah indian attacks and shipwrecks and i mean it it, it it sounds like a story she would have made up to sell books, right? But this this stuff's been verified. I trust. Yes. That she, this actually happened to her. Yes. Wow, that's yeah. just amazing. Yes, you know, I, I anyway. found her very impressive. I, understandably, I can yeah. see why you'd want to to share with us. Um, okay, you guys have been listening to this as I have. Any any questions for? For Betty, she's she's done her homework, and we have a member of the DAR here. <laughs> I would like to know the sources that you used for your books. Well, I had a lot of library books. I I think did I did I put I put it in the back there all my sources. Yeah, I think and they're there. Here's three books here that I also used. No, okay. Not there. No, I don't think I have it. No. Oh, maybe I have it. Let's see. No, we're back to the beginning here. Okay. I might have it in that. Uh, Book that's over there. Okay, the they, the sources are available. Yes, yes, <laughs> I have them here. Oh, you know what? You can see this. I can, if you'd like, I can tell you at the end. Of, oh. She's quite the researcher. I can vouch for that. <laughs> While she's looking, are there any other questions about Deborah? And she didn't hear, but did she I'll, have I'll get back to you. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, she had children. Yes, yeah, she had. Three children, and she adopted a child as well. Um, the mother died within a few weeks of the child being born, so she adopted. And ultimately, she and her husband ended up in their son's house. Yes, Earl. That was the, Earl. the yes. last house we showed, the White House. Okay. Yeah, uh, at 300 East Street, still okay. standing. The house, the house is still standing there, so yeah. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Just a comment. I had never heard of Deborah Sampson. The only woman I ever heard about who was involved in the revolution was Molly Pitcher. Until I had a job that took me through Sampson, uh, through Sharon on a regular basis. And I went to school in New Norfolk County. Nothing. It's funny, huh? I mean, you'll hear about Paul Revere, Sam Adams, John Adams, you know, George Washington, but they basically leave out anything any women have done. Um, I'm sure there are more. I, I do have, I do have a list of some of the women here that, I mean, there's a, Ian or Nancy Bailey of Boston, she called herself Sam Gay. There was a woman named Ann Smith. She uh, called herself Samuel Smith. And there was another woman from Elizabethtown. She's the one who did the curtsy. Oh, okay. <laughs> she was Sarah Osborne. 
<laughs> Habits are hard to break. They really are. <laughs> but no, I, I agree. I mean, I had heard yeah. of the Deborah Simpson chapter, the DAR, yeah. but I didn't know who she was. And as we were preparing for for that program, I did a little research. But I mean, you've done you've done a deep dive, <laughs> and, and I, I had I even not. I went to the encampment. <laughs> See, so uh, anyway, that's great. Any, any, uh, yes. I was a school librarian. Okay. And one of the first books I bought was the story of Deborah Sampson Gannett. Oh. <laughs> Great. Written at third and fourth grade level, mm -hmm. biographies for children. Deborah Sampson Gannett was a third cousin by marriage. Okay. <laughs> Her husband is a third cousin of okay. mine. Wow. And as I was saying to her earlier, Deborah was descended from three Mayflower passengers, yeah. possibly a fourth. Wow. And the husband is descended from at least two and possibly a third. Interesting. D deep Yankee roots there. Yeah. 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 Go going back about as early as you go. <laughs> well, not so far, because this goes back to the Revolutionary War, right. and then you're going back. Not that far from that. Yeah. yeah. But they were all from the Bridgewater, mm -hmm. East Bridgewater, some of them up into Abington, mm -hmm. the Gannett Mills. Oh, yeah, of course. They yeah. married Holbrooks. Okay. They married Haywards. Names we know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Most of you here know that Abington was established. Uh, but bef before it was established, it was the northern fringe of the Bridgewaters. And we are as far as you went in the Plymouth Colony before you got to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which was just over the line to Weymouth. So uh, these were dyed-in-the-wool uh, locals, yeah. you know, with, mm -hmm. with, with all, the right, uh, all the right genes. Yeah. Well, and she was uh, ridiculously healthy to have survived everything she yeah. did. Yeah. They were tough people. Clearly, yes. Um, the first one, Matthew Gannett, was a man of Kent, the first settlers of Situate. Okay. And he was the first one to move out, and he moved to East Bridgewater. Well, I know Gannett Road in Situate, so I mean, yeah, the, the name still exists there. Yeah. But, uh, absolutely. Good. All, all the ties. Yes, Marilyn. Since we live so close by, is there an easy way, or what, what would you do in what sequence to go visit some? some of these places or is okay. there a tour of there is a there's a um i left some brochures from the sharon library they actually have a little route in sharon that you can take in sharon yeah oh, cool. to visit um the places she would have lived in her final resting place where the dar has left a beautiful plaque plaque for her <laughs> a uh, self tour uh, it would be more of a self -tour. yes yes, yes, yes i think that so. right and and the Plimpton location still there as well, right? The Plimpton, yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know that. I I don't think I put her at the address anywhere. Okay. But it's in the books. It was in the books I read, though. Okay. So yes, there there is information available on that. That's cool. <laughs> Any other questions before I I thank Betty and uh, okay. release you all to refreshments in the back room. Okay. Well, uh, she'll be here, and so you can ask her questions personally if you're too shy to ask them here in front of the group. And thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll, I'll end by doing what I always do at the end of that, saying all the members of the Historical Society of Old Abington, please raise your hands. Look around to see who's not raising their hands and make sure you make them feel welcome. <laughs> and anyway, um, refreshments in the back room. Uh, we're back here again about a month from now for the show and tell for the Dyer family uh, legacy. Uh, the postcards are printed for it already. Uh, you'll get one either emailed to you or otherwise sent to you if you're on our list. But there are copies of it on the center table in the center hall here if you want to grab one now. But uh, they'll go out by normal means um, probably a week or so before. So you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciated. And look forward to seeing you back here in about a month. <laughs>